Micha, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, you, I, I've never studied with you formally, but uh, it is an opportunity to be in dialogue with you, and I've, I've certainly read your work and uh, admired you from afar. I did bump into an aunt of yours who's sitting here, Janet Freed, and I said, yep. you have a very impressive nephew, and she said, well, he's not the only one. Uh, they're, they're, they're all impressive, so perhaps at a future follow-up event, we could have some of your cousins and otherwise, um, who uh, apparently you're the schlepper of the family, and there are uh, more impressive uh, Goodmans, but uh, for a future Freed. event, uh, for a future Freed. So, um, and uh, to Rabbi Jacobs, to Rick, uh, it's wonderful to reconnect and to welcome you to Park Avenue Synagogue. I'm a little nervous because I, I don't know if you know the history, but um, Park Avenue Synagogue was actually historically a reform synagogue. That's why, um, that's why you're here, part of the <laughs> reclamation project of uh, why you are the fastest growing movement of American Judaism because you just keep bringing uh, them back. Yeah. So uh, uh, we welcome you, and, uh, and it's great to be in dialogue. Uh, Micha, I want to congratulate you on the success of your book, uh, Maimonides and the Book That Changed Judaism, Secrets of the Guide for the Perplexed. Uh, we've started studying it in my own Tuesday morning uh, philosophy class here at the synagogue, uh, and you've already uh, caused us uh, reason for being perplexed and being excited to welcome you here uh, this evening. Uh, I, wa I want to start out with a very brief but a very um, uh, I don't know if it's a softball or a fastball, but I'm just going to read the very first sentence um, of the book. Uh, not too much. People should still buy it. Uh, but I just want to give a, a taste of the very first sentence. It says, God is the greatest threat to religion. This paradoxical idea is central to the guide for the perplexed. God is the greatest threat to religion. Discuss. <laughs> Most secular Israelis, first of all, thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. And thank you, Gary and Thea, for organizing all this. Todaraba. Most secular Israelis believe in God. And when I discussed this issue with him, so why aren't you religious if you believe in God? And the best answer I got is... I'm not religious because I believe in God. In the history and philosophy, the greatest threat to religion didn't come from the people that didn't take God seriously. It always came from people that took God very seriously. Maimonides was one of them. Let me try to, in order to answer your question, I'd like to think about Maimonides' understanding of God and how does that challenge the traditional concept of religion? And hopefully that will help us create conversation. Let's start from the Bible, okay? Yechezkel Koifman, one of the greatest uh, biblical scholars that, that discussed the philosophy of uh, the, the theology of the biblical revolution, this is how he understood monotheism. Monotheism is not a belief that God is one. It's a belief that God is unique. This is how it sounds in Hebrew. Meaning monotheism is not shrinking the number of gods from many to one, but it's a radical separation of God from world. Rather, in the pagan world, gods were a part of nature, and the great forces of nature controlled the gods, and the pagan rituals were about worshiping the hidden mystery of nature, the forces of nature, monotheism comes around and separate gods from nature. And from now on, God is not trapped within nature. He is not locked inside the laws of nature. He is separated from nature. That was an important biblical move, the separation of God from world. I think in a deep sense, Rambam in the guide took the biblical revolution very seriously. And he asked the following question, if God is not a part of the world, therefore God cannot be a part of language either. I'll try to explain why. We use language in order to describe the world. And when we use the language that we develop to describe the world in order to describe God, 
So that puts God inside the category of the world. Language puts God and world in the same category. Let's think about this um, with an example. Um, Try to think of good people. My Aunt Janet is a good person. So is the Baal Shem Tov. He's a good person. So is Pope Francis, right? He's a good person. So we have my Aunt Janet. Sorry, Janet. The Baal Shem Tov and Pope Francis, they're all good. And then you say God is good. That puts God in the same category of my Aunt Janet. And the Baal Shem Tov and Pope Francis and Mama Teresa from Bombay. They're all, and all the good people you know, God is in the same. So they'll always say, no, well, God is, is way, he's, in a, he's on a whole different level of good. Yeah, that's true. But all you're saying is that God is more of the same thing. When God can be captured by language, that means God is a part of this world. Therefore, Rambam, in a very deep sense, realized that the only way to complete the revolution that began in the Bible, the only way to separate God from world, is to separate God from language. And as a result, we can't speak about God. We can't think about God. We can't imagine God. Let's make it even more interesting. Once we speak about God, it's not God anymore. Once we imagine God, that's Avodah Zarah. It's not God anymore. The Hebrew word that captures this movement of God from world and as a result from language is the word Kadosh. Holy, sacred, Kadosh. And the word Kadosh, if we think how it's used in the Bible, it's used in the following way. In Exodus, it says about Mount Sinai that it's Kadosh. It says, Hagbel etahar vekidashto. I'll explain. God tells Moses to tell the people that Mount Sinai is untouchable. You can't get close to it and you definitely can't touch it because it is holy. It is Kadosh. The holiest square yard in Jewish geography, the Kodesh Kodashin, the Holy of Holies, in the heart of the temple, is the square yard you were not allowed to enter. The holiest word in the Hebrew language is the word with four letters, God's name, Hashem HaMeforash, that we're not allowed to pronounce. Let's put this together. The word that you can't pronounce is holy. The space that is holy is a space you can't enter. The, the mountain is holy, is a mountain that you can't touch. What is holy? Holy is the untouchable. It's what's not accessible. It's what's beyond us. As Soloveitchik translates, holy is transcendent. It's the transcendent. It's what's beyond us. Which takes me to one of the greatest paradoxes of religion, as Peter Berger noticed. When God is kadosh and God is separated from the world, that secularizes the world. The hitkadshut of God, when God is sacred, in a very deep sense, it, the sacredness of God empties this world from its presence. Now, between the biblical move of separating God from nature and the completion of that move of separating God from language, we have the Talmudic move and the most one, maybe one of the most important Talmudic declarations is that prophecy ended. Pascha nevoah. That if in the Bible God wasn't a part of the world, but he did reveal himself to this world. And the Talmud, God is not a part of this world, and he doesn't even reveal himself to this world. And by the way, if he does, if he does intervene in a Talmudic argument, so what do the rabbis tell him? Stay out. Meaning God doesn't guide us anymore. God loses his authority to guide humanity. So I would say if in the Talmudic world they silenced God, Rambam completed that and said he didn't silence God. He silenced our conversation about God. From the Talmud, God doesn't speak to us anymore. In, my, in the guide, we can't speak about God anymore. And the quick history I'm trying to share with you now, from the Bible to the Talmud to Rambam, is the history of a God that becomes more and more distant. In the Bible, he is not part of nature. 
And the Talmud doesn't, rev doesn't reveal himself to us anymore. And then in the Middle Ages, in Rambam's revolution, we can't speak about him anymore. The history of God is a history of God becoming more and more Kadosh, and therefore more and more distanced, and therefore more and more far away. Now here's to the question. Religion needs a close God in order to make sense. Religion needs a God we can talk about, we can talk to, we can think about, and we can imagine. Religion needs more than that to make sense. Religion doesn't need only a God that we can think about and talk about. We need a God that we can talk to and change. We need a touchable God, a changeable God, a God that listens to our prayers and changes his mind when we pray. A God that we can satisfy by performing rituals and doing the mitzvot. That's the God of religion. Meaning the God of Maimonides empties religion from its significance. If, again, if we take God seriously, the whole structure of religion collapses. Let me make it a little bit more blunt, okay? I got in trouble for saying the following line in Israel. According to Rambam, a God that you, could change, that you can control through ritual is by definition not God. Because if you could change him, control him, so it's not him. It's not, I mean, not even a him. It's <laughs> if it's so touchable, so controllable, it's not Kadosh, it's not God. Therefore, the most ancient form of heresy is religion. Now, here's where I got in trouble in, in, uh, when my book came out in, in, in Israel. So I was invited to this um, TV show um, led by Kobe Meidan. Now, Kobe Meidan is, in his, is, I think, the greatest interviewer in Israel, and he's like the therapist interviewer. He's soft, he's nice, and after five minutes, you forget that you're on TV, you think you're in therapy. <laughs> you're like, you know, there's no cameras, you start sharing with him your deepest mm. secrets about Ann Janet. <laughs> so, so after five minutes, I had this following line. I said, you see, Religion is the most ancient form of heresy. Again, because if God is, religion assumes that you could change God, that's not God, therefore it's heresy. So obviously they have to sell the show, right? So there's promotions for the show, so the entire week. Now, out of 24 minutes of conversation, which line did they obviously choose? So you see me seeing on TV, religion is heresy, that's all. Now, Hadati kfira. Now, ever since then, I still get comments on the street. Why did you say that religion is heresy? But I think in a very deep sense, this is the problem. This is one of the, the most important problems in the history of theology, that, that there is a theological zero-sum game between God and religion. If we take religion seriously, that makes God a very small God, a God that you can control, that you could change his mind, a God that needs mitzvot. That's a very small God. If you take God seriously, well, religion loses its meaning. And that zero-sum game between God and religion is the reason for the line you open. That is why God is a threat to religion. When you take God seriously, it's hard to take religion seriously. Now, I think that this is the perplexity. The perplexity that is born is not born in the hearts and minds of people that take religion seriously and they believe that they change God by performing mitzvot. It's not a perplexity of people that take God seriously and therefore they reject religion. These two types are not perplexed. The perplexed person is a perplexed that wants to hold on to a kadosh God, a God that is so great it's beyond our understanding and still feels emotionally very connected to religion. The one who doesn't want to give up both poles, that person is perplexed. And for that person, Rambam wrote the guide for the perplexed. The guide for the perplexed is to build the bridge not between religion and philosophy. My argument is not between Athens and Jerusalem. The guide for the perplexed is an attempt to build the bridge between Rambam's God and Rambam's religion. And how does he deal with that? How does he build that bridge? How does he reconcile between his God and his religion? Well, for that, he wrote an entire book 
Moren Nebuchim, the guy for the perplexed. And if you want to understand how he does that, well, you should read Moren Nebuchim. And if you don't want to read the guide for the perplexed, read you could it. also read a book that came out lately. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it clearly struck a nerve. Uh, I want to, in a moment, dive into the claims of the book of how Rambam actually sought to resolve this uh, contradiction. So, so wh what's going on yeah. that... Uh, I mean, I just mean Vic just had a small, quick conversation about that. Here's what happened, and I think, um, let me, in very, very broad strokes, share something about Israel. The original, and I'm making now broad generalizations, and I'm on camera, so I'll get in trouble for this. The original sin of orthodoxy in Israel, and this is a generalization, it's not true about all Dati, all religious Israelis. It is the sin of dogmatism. The sin of dogmatism is when you believe that your opinions happen to be also God's opinions, which, by the way, that's an amazing coincidence. It's, it's, it's real, it's, it's a real schut. <laughs> when you believe that your opinions happen to be God's opinions, you can't listen anymore. You're trapped in your opinions. And if anyone disagrees with you, he doesn't disagree with you. He disagrees with God. That turns that person not into a person that's wrong. That turns that person into a sinner. I can't even argue with that person. I have to somehow shout at that person. So that's not all the te'ima dogmatic, but the temptation of dogmatism is there. The problem of secular Israelis, and again, this is a broad generalization. This is not true about all secular Israelis. This is only a stereotype. Stereotype, Stereotypes have a tendency to be right. <laughs> the original sin of secular Israelis is the sin of ignorance. You could be a graduate of the Mamlachti school system, not always, but many times, and not to know how to read Ketav Rashi, not to know basic, basic Talmud, not even to know what the founding fathers of secular Zionism knew, their way around the Bible. Now, Israel is what happens when ignorance meets dogmatism. And it's not a nice scene. And the possibility of a conversation collapses. Now, what I try to do in this book, and what I try to do in my work on Ain Prat, and what I think many people are trying to do in Israel, is to fight both battles, to crack the dogmatism of the religious community in Israel, to erode the ignorance and create new excitement about Judaism in the secular community in Israel. And I think this is happening in Israel, and, this, and I think the success of this book is a testimony that that's happening in Israel, is that religious Israelis read this book and something happened to them, they opened up. Some of them opened up. They realized that Judaism is more rich and has different ideas than they thought. Secular Israelis, something else happened to them. And that is, when they read this book, so this is a lot of um, comments I got just from secular Israelis. They said that they felt that diff certain intuitions that they had and opinions that they were proud of. And they thought that those intuitions, those opinions were a critique of Judaism. When they read my book, they realized maybe it's a voice within Judaism. They, re re they realized they don't, that that. that that everything that they were is not just a rejection of Judaism, but Judaism is so large, it has room for them too. So I think those two moves happens to different readers and different types of readers um, in Israel. Great. And, and so, Rabbi Jacobs, no one, no one studied, uh, I'm a student of American religion, of, of the ref leader of the reform movement. You serve American Jews. And, and the, the construct that Micha has set up is um, this notion of, uh, religion being as a threat to God, God as a threat to religion, and I'm what, is, is it? I mean, w do you? Th what do you think is drawing people away from uh, religion in America, or or is a, is the landscape totally different here f uh, in American Jewry? Now first of all, it's, it's a great question, and um, I have to begin by saying the first time I encountered Micha's book. I was in the Knesset, not in the Beit Knesset, not in a synagogue, in the Knesset in Israel. I had a meeting with Ehud Barak, who was then finishing his last months in the Knesset. And I walk in, I think we're going to have a big conversation about peace, <laughs> about Israel, about Zionism. Who knows what we're going to talk about? I walk in, he's got this on his desk. He said, let's talk about the Moren Nebuchim. <laughs> I said, can we talk about that second? <laughs> there are a few things first. So I asked him what he thought of the book. 
He said it was extraordinary. He said he was not one to read books like this, but this book engrossed him. So I just want to say that's actually, I think, some of the excitement. But your question is about our landscape right. and the landscape of North American Jewry. And obviously, um, you and I serve a similar kihila, uh, a similar congregation. I want to say that I think Micha's book, his reading and rereading of Maimonides, opens up new possibilities. In fact, that opening sentence opens up possibilities. Because I just want to reflect on Nepal for a moment and the earthquake. I think the biggest threat to religion is how people speak in the name of religion. So let's have two examples. The first example is Rabbi Moshe Sternbuck, who is the who is from the Eida Haridit, he's from the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, he's the, uh, the, 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 the Av Beit Din of this wonderful, intense um, religious court. He said to his students in the yeshiva right after the, um, the earthquake in Nepal, he said, the earthquake in Nepal is sending us a message. Students want to know, what is the message? The message is that the standards of conversion in Israel Mm. are potentially <laughs> catastrophic. Now, I, I do not know more than, than Rabbi Sternbuck, and I, and I don't know his yeshiva. But I know that a statement like that, if someone is on the edge of wanting to come into our world and to live in the textual study and the practice and the commitment to shaping a world as God intended it to, honestly, they are, they're just running towards the door at that moment. But I think it's even embedded in the very fabric of our liturgy in other places where, you know, oftentimes we presume that we understand God. So just think for a moment about the earthquake. The earthquake in Nepal was seven point something on the Richter scale. More than 8,000 people died. In Haiti, a few years back, an earthquake of exactly the same magnitude killed 300,000 people. In Chile, the same year, there was an earthquake that was 8.4 on the Richter scale. Only a few hundred died. What is the thought? The thought is, where is God in these horrific acts? What is God saying through the Haredi rabbi or through others? And the answer is, the reason so many died in Haiti, I would just maintain, is not a theological category. It's a human category. There are no standards of building. If buildings had been built properly in Haiti, maybe a few dozen people, God forbid, would have died. It became, misfortune became an injustice because of what we human beings did not do. I read in Micha's book different theological and religious possibilities that I think are exactly what is missing from our discourse here in North America. We have a category called the nuns, right? When they see the different choices for their own religious affiliation, they say none of the above. And many of them, when you actually probe, are allergic to the things of fundamentalist Christianity and, frankly, fundamentalist Judaism. And they'd rather be spiritual but not religious. They'd rather be unconnected formally but exploring because they actually have categories of God. They have categories of spiritual living. I think if we can give not only a framework, not just a contemporary rabbinic framework, but a framework that comes from one of the most brilliant and iconoclastic thinkers of, of our tradition, it gives a new floor upon which to build a religious life. It actually allows us to reclaim a tradition that so many have lost and to take seriously what it might mean to perform mitzvot, what it might mean to find political action or even contemplative experiences of God. So I find this to be so liberating. And of course, the secular Israelis are finding it to be such. Uh, more open-minded, enlightened, orthodox readers, I would say for North Americans who've lost their way in the religious landscape, the book can be a doorway in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, let, so let's dive into one of the categories, um, because this idea that um, religion uh, needs to be sort of asserted in a new way and to maintain this static, infinite expression, notion of God. Um, start with an easy one or a hard one, mitzvot. Yeah. The idea of being commanded. Okay, so 
Uh, every time I say, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Al, right, Asher Kichanu B'mitzvotah V'tivanu, I understand that mitzvah, whatever that mitzvah to do, being, uh, to be an expression of my relationship to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, mm -hmm. that God wants, asks, demands, depending on my stripe in uh, Jewish life, to, for me to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and in the fulfillment of that mitzvah, um, I'm fulfilling God's will, or if not, then, then uh, uh, in objection to God's will. And yet, uh, so how would, or how does Maimonides, um, Rambam, uh, give me language of mitzvah mm. while retaining mm. this, this image of God? In the Kabbalah, as it's commonly understood, or a certain stream within Kabbalah, there is understanding that by performing mitzvot, we're restoring an inner balance within God. In some sense, the divine structure lost its balance. By performing mitzvot, we are creating, we're, 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 we're balancing God. That's a radical idea. I'm not a, I'm not a Kabbalist, and it's, but for Rambam, that would be an impossible idea. Rambam would reverse it. He would say, by practicing the mitzvot, we're not balancing the divine structure, we're balancing our own personality. Mitzvot don't change the mitzvah, God the commander. It changes the mitzvah, changes the human being, the one that's commanded. And Rambam invests 25 chapters in the guide. In volume three, chapter, from chapter 25 to chapter 50, 25 chapters, to di he dives into the mitzvot, and he tries to explain in what way and in what sense do those mitzvot, what is their impact on the person that performs them? Let me say one more thing. Rambam, in this sense, is an Aristotelian. Rambam argue, uh, Aristotle argued with Socrates and Plato when they discussed how do you create virtue? How do you create the ideal personality? And Aristotle argues that the ideal personality is a balanced personality. A person, all his characteristics are balanced. Not, nothing is to the extreme. How do you produce that balanced personality? So Socrates, and in some way Plato too, they believe that the way to elevate your personality is by elevating your understanding of virtue. If you understand virtue, you'll be virtuous. Aristotle didn't agree with that. Aristotle, you can understand things and still not be those things. I, I, I know a doctor in Israel that his uh, mumchiyut, his uh, profession, he, he deals with lungs. How do you call that? A uh, lung doctor. Pulmonologist. How is it? Pulmonologist. A pulmonologist that smokes two packs a day. <laughs> he understands what it the damage of smoking. He doesn't want to be a smoker, and yet he smokes. There is a gap between what you understand and who you are. That's a critique of Aristotle on Socrates, and Aristotle argued what we are is not what we think. What we are is the sum of our habits. And by changing what you do, you eventually change what you are. That means that we, we like to think that our actions are expression of our tchunot, our traits. Our actions are expressions of our traits. Aristotle turns that around. Our actions are not only expressions of our traits. They also create our traits. Wait, but you're saying this and like past assault. Or, I mean, this is heresy. Meaning, how, this is a man who wrote um, Mishneh the Mishneh Torah. This is a, who, who codified all of mitzvot. Yeah. And, and, and just to simply describe the notion of mitzvah, as a, a regimen, like eating right or some way to refine my characteristics um, without God in the equation, that, that, no, that's... God shared with us the wisdom of how to perfect ourselves. And by perfecting ourselves, we are becoming more and more like God. Meaning, what mitzvot are about, they're about changing our habits to perfect ourselves to make us more and more like God, which means mitzvot are not about changing God, it's about making us more godly. But who, who gave the mitzvot? Who commanded the mitzvot? I, uh, you're, it's not, who did Rambam say? Okay. <laughs> well, it's my understanding, and, and the whole the entire guide of the perplex is only one chapter where Ram, Rambam deals with how it was, how was the Torah revealed, and this is how I've learned to understand this. It's, chapter, it's volume one, 
chapter 54. And Ramba, the, the world is a reflect, in the world, nature is a, reflect in, a reflection of, divine, of God's wisdom. What Moshe did, he studied the structure of nature and then created the law, which is a reflection of the wisdom of nature. And since it's a perfect reflection of nature, the law is divine. Let me say this very quickly. If the wisdom of nature is divine and the Torah is an imitation of nature and has within it the principles of nature, therefore the Torah has divine wisdom, is a reflection of divine wisdom. So I would say there's, a, there's a, the famous Midrash where it says that God looked at the Torah and created the world. According to Rambam, Moses looked at the world and created the Torah, and that's why the Torah is divine, because it's a reflection of the divine wisdom planted in nature. So, so Rabbi Jacobs, you, you uh, as a reform rabbi, as a thinker and leader, need to find a language of mitzvot um, that um, also acknowledges, validates, embraces that we live in an era of, a so of the sovereign self, that the notion of heteronomy, of being commanded, um, may not have the resonance or traction uh, in American Judaism. Uh, is, is this language of mitzvah uh, resonant uh, as a reformed Jew, or what? What is, or to frame it the other way, what would be the compelling rationale for the observance of a commandment through a reform movement ideology? So, I actually, think as a movement, that's one of the the really important and hard questions for us, because if you take away the Mitzavah, the one who commands. If you say, I don't understand a God who would command something as specific as shatnitz, right? Um, mixing, you know, uh, fabrics, you know, wool and linen. I mean, how, how would I understand? So if, 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 if that's how we understand God, uh, clearly we're not understanding the nature of divinity. Um, so I think that for us to try and capture language that is serious, that also grounds practice in more than just whim. You know, th this feels good this week, but next week I don't, I don't think I will feel, you know, as committed to do this thing, Shabbat or prayer or keeping kashrut in my home. But I think that the, the language that he uses is remarkably comparable to Lawrence Kohlberg's when he has in his theory of moral development. You know, obviously for Rambam, he talks about the, you know, the shaping and refining of character. And there's a, a ladder that one can, uh, you know, kind of climb in one's practice. One can do, you know, in, in third grade, one can do the right thing because someone's going to give you a, a cookie or they're going to let you, you know, stay out and play with your friends. That works maybe when you're three or four. And then the rewards and the potential punishments grow. I think, honestly, that world feels like it makes religious life seem rather juvenile. And if God is like my kindergarten teacher, you know, is going to give me a cookie if I do something right and is going to do... That where, where is that? And, and Kant was the one who really brought into our language that this idea of uh, heteronymous law, the law that comes from outside, as opposed to the law that grows within, the practice that grows within. So I think, you know, and, and Kohlberg talks about moral development from the self-centered, right, to the, the place where I become connected to my family and the well-being of my community, and then the highest bar. I actually understand the real essence of, of acts of conscience. And I'm not actually thinking of any kind of external reward. I just know it to be right. But for all of us, and I think the brilliance of the Rambam is that we are in need of a behavioral tradition, not only ideas about this. It, to, to sit in the academy, wherever that academy might be, and just read about you know, perfecting the human being, it's just not effective. We, we all know and maybe that doctor who's still smoking could use a, a different kind of behavioral path but the path of mitzvot refines us and allows us to ascend, not always. Because we all know religious people who, you know, they're, they're still in that sort of beginning stage. And there's no automatic guarantee that we will, you know, raise ourselves to the higher and higher level. But that, that is a divine enterprise. And I think there's a, as you articulated, it sounds like Harold Schulweis, there's a godliness in my life. If I'm keeping kashrut, one of the things that's clear, I do keep kashrut, one of the things that's clear does it teach me to have some limits, right? To limit some of my appetites. And as a person developing a moral character, that's incredibly powerful, even transformative. 
Um, and I'm not just sitting, you know, thinking about, you know, what I'm going to eat or what I can't eat, but I actually think, you know what, the whole world's not mine. Mm -hmm. And the world doesn't start and begin with Rick Jacobs. It begins with a, a, a bigger agenda for the universe. And it moves me from, you know, the, the confines of myself to, to life in a, you know, in a shared holy community. So I, I think this is actually much more the language of 21st century Judaism and maybe part of the problem for Rambam in the guide was that, you know, he was articulating things that really, you know, were, were not his time. way before his time. And I think, that just to be candid and critical of, of, of Reform Judaism, I think the sense of owning a mitzvot and a religious practice that's demanding without at the same time having to create a God that, that doesn't really, in my mind and many others, reflect who God really is. Um, I think is powerful. So I, I think this actually is a pathway uh, in, in terms of practice, not just in terms of understanding theology. You, you tagged on something, and I want to ask a couple more questions, and then we'll open it up, which is, um, who, who was Rambam's audience? I mean, if he was someone before, I mean, he kind of sounds yeah. like he might be a good contemporary thinker, except he, didn't, he doesn't live right now. Um, who, who was he writing to? Um, what was the difference between his audience and this book, and uh, which was written in Arabic, and, and the Mishnah Torah, which was written in Hebrew? Uh, who, who was he aimed at? The book was written in Arabic and Hebrew letters, which means Arab Jews. Because he thought that you won't be able to find in Europe Hebrew-speaking Jews that have the intellectual depth to understand his words. That's what he thought about European Jews. By the way, that's what some European Jews think today about Jews coming from the Arab world. Just the world was reversed. He thought, as far as he's concerned, he's writing a personal letter to one student. And that's how the, how, that's how the guide is written. It's as if it's a letter. And by the way, there is a name to that letter, Rabbi Yosef ben Rabbi Yehuda. Someone asked him a question, I'm just giving you an answer. It's kind of long. And he's trying to achieve two things by that. And that's how the book opens. It's a letter to someone very specific. When you read the book, you kind of feel like you're peeking into something that's not yours. The reader of the guide always carries guilt. Maybe I'm not the reader of the guide. So the reader of the guide is the perplexed, is the perplexed person. But Rambam didn't think that the ideal person is a person that's not perplexed. He thought that the ideal per because the opposite of the navuch is the chsil, is the um, ignorant. Ramam thought that the ideal person is the perplexed. Someone uh, share with me the irony that sometimes the only way to think clearly is to be confused. And that's, that's, the, um, that's the audience he wrote through and he thought that this was a secret. He thought that this knowledge and this understandings will be very, very dangerous if people read. And if you're not the ideal reader, this knowledge will threaten your soul. It will challenge who you are as a person. Everything will collapse in your world. 20 years, and that's why, by the way, in the end of this book, in the end of the introduction to the book, there is a shvua. He makes you swear that if you manage to read his book, uncover the secret of the book, you're not allowed to share it with anyone. Which means Rambam tried to create a reality that if you're loyal to his shvua, how do you say shvua? It's his vow. Yeah? It's his vow. If you're loyal to it, so you're not allowed to write a book about the guide of the perplexed. It's a great marketing. You should do that in your book. Yeah. <laughs> and you're allowed to do panels on the guide of the perplexed. Right. And I give teacher, a, a teacher the guide of the perplexed. The interesting thing is that 800 years after the, 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 for the past 800 years, ever since this book was written, is 800 years of different people violating the vow. The people who are most curious about the, about the guide for the perplexed are people that violate the vow of the guy of the perplex. Just one last thing, 20 years after he writes his book, Shmuel Ibn Tibon, one of his greatest disciples, explains why he is not loyal to the Rambam. And he says it's because he loves the Rambam. And he's going to share the secrets because and he says the following. In his days, back in his time, it was 20 years ago. Back in those days, he says, it was dangerous to know this knowledge. Today, it's dangerous not to know this knowledge. I, I don't know if this, was tr this statement was true in Ibn Tibbon's time. I think it's definitely true in the 21st century. 
this knowledge, these understandings, these questions, and these answers. There's also answers in this book. They might have been threatening to people in the Middle Ages. Today, I think it's threatening not to know this knowledge, these questions, these answers in the 21st century. Thank you. Um, thank you. I want to uh, throw a curveball here, or prerogative. I, I want to respectfully disagree with the two of you, and maybe the Rambam, which is to say, I, I serve a congregation. Many of my congregants are here uh, this evening. I think people like the idea of mitzvah. I think people want to feel that their actions are in response to the divine will. I think people want to believe um, that, and, and that the that the the joy and the attraction of religion is the idea that when we take out the Torah from the Ark, right, bezot Torah, that this is a a revelation of God's will containing narrative, containing legislation. I may or may not participate in that, right? But um, the drama of being religious is to be engaged in the rites, rituals, ceremonies of religion. And um, to turn religion into a religion of reason is um, to turn this institution to, into a 92nd Street Y, which I love, but is not the point of going to shul. Mm -hmm. The going to sh point of going to shul is to stand in relationship to God, mm -hmm. um, and, and that uh, so compelling as uh, this thesis might be, and it's a beautiful book, it's a beautiful book, I'm just wondering um, how compelling this is to the Jew in the pew. Um, I, I do believe that the, um, you know, the, the third section, Micha, where you, you talk about the power of doubt and perplexity and how that needs to be um, not a source of disillusion but of being leveraged into a, a, a life of a religious spiritual journey, I, I think that, that very much speaks to the contemporary longings of, 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 of a Jew. But... Um, but I, I just wanted to log that and, and maybe give you gentlemen a, a chance to respond. Okay. Let me respond in the name of the Ramba. <laughs> Maimonides is a rich book. There are many chapters and many contradicting voices within the guide. And he writes that in the introduction to the guide. He's saying, I am going to contradict myself. A great uh, disciple of the Ramba, Rabbi Avraham Abulafia, noticed that in Hebrew there's a great connection between contradiction and secret between stira and seter. Sti English loses that. Stira means contradiction is stira, and secret means seter. And says that Bulafia, and then in the guy for the perplex, yeshnam starim. Beneath the contradictions lies the secret. And um, when it comes to mitzvot, so there's also another Rambam in the guide. And to understand this Rambam, it's Rambam of one chapter. It's volume three, chapter um, 52, Gimel Nun Bet, 352, yeah. And he has the following understanding. I didn't write about this because I didn't want to write about this. <laughs> so you're getting now the version that wasn't written. And um, w William James, this is how he learned to understand this. William James and his... One of my most, my most, by the way, this is one of my favorite books in the world, The Variety of the Religious Experience of William James. He tries, as a psychologist, to try to capture and describe religious moments. And he describes a religious moment that many people from many generations and many religions um, describe. It's a moment where you feel like you are, are aware of the presence of the mystery. You're aware of a presence of something that you can't understand you can't touch, you can't see, and yet it's there. And he says those are moments, they evaporate after a few minutes, but they're there. There are moments that different people, and so Rambam in, three, in 352, he turns us around. He says that feeling the presence of the mystery is a moment that you achieve through mitzvot. Why? Because mitzvot, classically understood, is our reaction to the presence of God. 
God commands, and we react with the mitzvot. Mitzvot is a reaction to God. Rambam says psychologically it also works the other way around. By practicing mitzvot and doing as if you're reacting to God, you'll start having a feeling that there's something there that you're reacting to. Meaning it's not that mitzvot or reaction to an experience of God's presence, mitzvot create the sense of God's presence. And that move, to me as someone that is a very, I don't want to say I'm, you know, mitzvot is a, you know, who's challenged with mitzvot. This is a very compelling understanding of mitzvot, and it helps me make sense out of it. Maybe mitzvot are about, are not about perfecting myself. Maybe they're about me understanding that it's not only about myself. So I, I love the agitation, and um, and first of all, who among us should say to someone who comes on Shabbos morning or on Wednesday morning uh, to be part of the circle of minyan that you know? Well, you, you really aren't commanded to be here. I mean, who, who among us has the chutzpah to, to to speak in that way? But I think what's what's so powerful, it's particularly in the third section when you talk about um, there's a whole discussion of therapeutic perplexity. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was really hard about our teacher, Rabbi David Hartman, of blessed memory, and um, Rabbi Hartman was, you know, was my teacher and, and, and I had the privilege of studying a Rambam with him. And frankly, you know, the, the, the Rambam that, that Rabbi David Hartman opened us to at first was, was so rational, the philosopher, um, and it was so lacking in, um, you know, spiritual um, power. And I think of not just William James, but Rudolf Otto, the idea of the holy, the, the numinous, right? There's something so profound. And um, I remember towards the end of, uh, of Rabbi Hartman's life, we were sitting at Kol, not at Kol Neshama, though we were sitting there once uh, for Rafi Ellenson's bar mitzvah, and uh, Rabbi Hartman was fine davening in Kol Neshama with all of his heart. We were sitting in his daughter Tova's shul, Shira Hadashah. And Rabbi Hartman, who loved the philosophical dimension, had his eyes closed. And he's singing in a way that was not a part of his practice. I think you actually have a, a spiritual you know, underpinning to the Rambam. Mm -hmm. So it's not a dry, philosophical, rational system, which mm -hmm. does not agree with the, the deep yearning of today and the sense of trying to find a pathway in. So I think that there's a, a, a richness, and if again, the last thought I would use is the, is the latter. It may not be that the mitzvot come to us, handed to us from God, but I believe deeply that they are you know, rungs for us to climb higher and to, and to enter a deeper level of, uh, of oneness with God, with the world that God created, and the world that God is hoping we will help to shape. So I think there is a sacred dimension to the mitzvot, and I don't think it's just made up. And it's not the same as you know, going for a jog, as good as that will be for our health and well-being. Um, so I, I think we need to recapture a sense of, uh, of, of real, you know, th there's, there's, there's a, an obligation, there's a, a, a deep feeling of commitment. And, and you have created that, if I could just take a, a moment of personal privilege. In, in the most exciting way in this congregation. And your leadership is, uh, is paving a path for, I, I would say, all people who are serious about their faith. And uh, you, know, um, you may think that your pulpit is just your pulpit, the people who sit, but there are many of us um, who read and, and pay very close attention when you think of conversion, when you think of how we are going to relate to those outside you know, the, uh, the typical Jewish family. So, I, I think what you're building is precious and uh, that you could you know, teach a lot of us how to do that. But I don't think we're undermining the plausibility structure of the religion that you, you know, not just practice, but have inspired others to practice. I think we're, we're talking about broadening and widening that plausibility structure so that many people who, who really see dogmatism, who see narrowness, who see intolerance, who see all those things that are consuming our world, and say, how, how, is, how is this you know, a path for the, the universe to go forward? And what is religion's you know, sinfulness in this as opposed to its redemptive quality?
Thank you, and thank you for your very generous words, Rabbi. Um, let's open it up for questions. I'm well aware, did I see, yeah, right. Uh, just to be on the record, we do have the world authority on Mordechai Kaplan here, um, El Skull, and I'm tempted to ask to what degree this is a Kaplanian vision of, uh, of Rambam here, but maybe we'll get that later. There was a hand up in the back, um, and let's open it up for some questions as well. You mentioned that uh, the word kadosh expresses God's remoteness from the world, from language, from mankind, from nature. But doesn't it say in the Torah, kadoshim to you, that you, with we, mankind, should be holy? So isn't that a form of linkage to God rather than an expression of remoteness? I think question by question. Yeah. So for, this is a great question, a powerful question. There's many, many answers to, to, to kadoshim to you. I want to uh, quote Rashi, but have, have what Rabbi Jacob had in mind. Rashi says, being God is separate from the world, therefore if you're a Kodosh, you have to in some way separate your, yourself from the world. Kodoshim to you, Rashi writes, Purushim to you. That's what it means to be holy, to be separated. And I think was very inspired by a comment that you said, that mitzvot is also to remind me that the world is not mine, that it's not only about me. You said it's not only about Rick Jacobs. I think I assume you you mean, I mean anyone has to say that. About, I mean I can also say I also think the world's not about Rick Jacobs, <laughs> but I don't think that what you that's <laughs> that's what you meant. So I think that that's a good interpretation of Kadoshim to you, realizing that that's I don't own the world. The world is not there to serve me. It's some way, and it's a in a deep sense, it challenges our egocentric illusions about the world. I I certainly don't want to be in any way disrespectful because I've really listened to all three of you extraordinary uh, learned uh, scholars. And, um, and yet, all of your words have not convinced me at all that I should believe in God. Um, I'm just going to go back to uh, watching the person you love most disappear in front of your eyes from Alzheimer's or pancreatic cancer or all the genocides, the Holocaust. Um, as, as a learned person, I mean, as, a, as an educated person myself, I would have liked to have heard from one of you, I mean, your words are beautiful, and believe me, I absorbed them all, and I'm, I'm, I feel really good being here, but I would have liked from one of you to give me a reason why I should believe in God more. Rabbi? T telling people that they should believe in God is, is certainly, uh, you know, has been part of the rabbinic profession for, for a lot of centuries. But feeling that I should believe in God and helping people to experience and feel um, deeply, you know, connected to God is a very different enterprise altogether. And to believe in God feels also not to be the project of the Jewish people. Um, that's about a certain set of assertions or beliefs but the same way the people we love, we come to trust and count on them in ways that we can't even articulate. Um, to open our hearts and our minds deeply to a world that is you know, so infused with, with, with God um, and to remove all the things that we stop our search because we say, oh, this is God, or I now understand, or I can now point to God. And that stops us way short of the spiritual finish line of, of where we need to go, how, how much more deeply we need to encounter. And to, you know, the moments you describe of watching a loved one, you know, with Alzheimer's or, you know, fight cancer to the end. You know, those are places, by the way, sometimes that we actually come to, again, have faith, not necessarily belief in, but faith in, in, a, in a world, in a universe that... Um, that, that reflects so much of, of God, but we actually can't. This is where I think Rambam so helps us. Whenever we think we can just point to it or explain it or invoke it or uh, ask it to, you know, to kind of watch over us and you know, not necessarily, don't be so busy with the rest of the world, God. I need you with my loved ones now. I think the, the Rambam is trying to give us um, the deepest possible way to understand God. And it is not simple. And I think all of us, all of us fall short. Maybe the Rambam didn't fall short. But my guess is he probably also fell a little bit short of that. And that is to actually 
put us really on the spiritual quest in, in, in the most profound way. I think that's, that's what we're all involved in. And, um, you know, to, to, to feel like, oh, I got it. I got a rabbinical degree. I got my doctorate. I, 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 oh, I, I made my way to the, 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 the guide. I, I got it now, is to know that you, we don't got it. We don't have it. And I think that um, perplexity, I, I, I'm always struck that even perplexity and agnosticism, I think that, uh, that humility comes with not having that certainty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the human condition. I don't think we, we're, not, we're not given that gift to have that certainty. Boy, does that make us um, better human beings and better citizens of um, holy communities and allow us to shape a world of reason and compassion and justice. And, and not to put it off on God and say, you know, God help and God, you know, if I, if I just imagine all the ways in which, you know, we go and visit a person who's struggling with illness, that's godliness in, in the human touch. And I think that, um, that that's, that's our place and I think it is profound. I think it is, it, it could be a God intoxicated world that we live in, but it's not the world where we slaughter one another in the name of that God. Um, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, by way of uh, conclusion, I just want to uh, read um, the very end of the book, just to give everyone a... Actually, you should read it. You wrote no, it. No, no, no. I, I want to listen to it. <laughs> because I think it goes a little bit to uh, this last question. Uh, the reader who makes his way through the storm of ideas that the Rambam unle unleashed in the guide who successfully negotiates complex discussions about religious language, proofs for the existence of God, dilemmas around the question of creation, and debates about prophecy, providence, a problem of evil, and the reasons for the commandments, finds himself at the end of the book in a discussion about the purpose of life. And the following paragraph is, a, what is the true purpose of life? And a few possibilities are given. But uh, Micha concludes with the following. In the end, the issue remains open. Maimonides does not proclaim that any one of these options is superior to the others. He walks with his readers to the border of the promised land, a whole fulfilled life, but does not enter it with us. Like Moses, the son of Amram, he remains behind, looking down from the mountain, enabling his readers to make their own way onward. So, Micha, you have given uh, the contemporary reader a guide to the guide, and we are all richer for it. Um, and you've also given us the tools um, in this book and with this evening uh, to continue uh, our own way onward, and we are all grateful to you for doing that. Thank you so much, Micha, and thank you so much. For be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.